Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Phil Pask, who's at home after having uh, hopefully just a bug yesterday. So, Phil, thank you very much for joining. Um, good morning, Andy. Thanks for asking me to come and speak to you, really. No problem. Well, we've actually not met before, but um, various people have mentioned you. Um, you've obviously got a chartered physiotherapist background, but having done a bit of research, I can see you've got quite an interesting past as well. So just talk, tell me about where you're from. Yeah, basically I'm old. Is that what you're saying, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> where do you want me to begin? Um, I, uh, I am a, a chartered physiotherapist, obviously now with a special interest in sports medicine that's developed over my career. Um, I actually started, uh, I'm kind of sports mad, really, if you, if you like, um, always football and, and rugby at school. I'm from Chef, uh, Worksock near Sheffield, Chef Wednesday fan, always wanted to be a professional footballer but wasn't good enough, but unfortunately I was quite good at rugby, so I ended up going that, that direction, or fortunately, really. Um, managed to get through, sp through school be through the sport, really, dedicated PE department at uh, Worksop, uh, got me to university, went to Birmingham University and did one of the very first sports uh, science, single honours PE actually, degree in the country. It was uh, myself and um, a lady called Barbara Slater, we were the only two doing the single honours degree in physical education. So this was about 1978. She was Barbara Slater. She's now uh, head of the outside broadcasting for uh, the BBC. So we've both done pretty well, considering, because at the end of that, you know, you got that degree in PE. It's not like these days. There were no other, no way you could go other than teaching. And I desperately didn't want to be a teacher. But guess what I ended up doing <laughs> for seven years? PE teacher. Um, I then joined North... Uh, I got married and moved to Northampton, joined Northampton Saints. So... Um, but whilst I was there, I decided that um, it was time to change career. So I, I got talking to the physio, my physio at the team. We were amateurs then, back then, although it was an elite level sport. So you were uh, actually playing for Northampton at that point then? Yeah, I went down to Northampton to play for one game and 35 years later, I'm still there. And that'll, that'll come out later on. So I, talk, I thought I need to change a profession. I didn't really want, the teaching was not a great period at that time because of the industrial action and everything else. I was a young and enthusiastic guy. Um, and the physio, physio there said, well, what about moving that way? So I actually uh, gave up my job. My wife supported me. The club supported me. I went back and retrained at Birmingham University. So I went back to Queen Elizabeth School of Medicine at Birmingham. So having already had four years, I went back for another four to Birmingham and qualified whilst I was playing as an amateur uh, uh, sort of semi-pro rugby union player retrained and that was back in uh, 1990 and then thereafter it's all um, you know with the continued professional development it's all gone from being a broad-based general physiotherapist to I suspect really now at the top of this little triangle in terms of sports medicine but also sports medicine in, in rugby medicine really mm. and that's how it's gone Never by design, Andy. It's just sort of happened by coincidence. And I think, you know, good luck and good management, really. Yeah. And so just going back to that, for, for one, like when you were, so you were actually more into football than you were rugby. You just well, were well, well, as kids. I mean, up until 11, I didn't know what a rugby ball was, apart from the rugby league up, up north. I wanted to play for Sheffield Wednesday. In fact, I still want to go and work for Sheffield Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I have told them this. Um but um, when I got to university, I had to make a choice of, you couldn't play all the sports then, you could at school. And I just had to be better at rugby um, and, and became a fairly accomplished rugby player. So I managed, I actually played then for Saints for 10 years. The whole idea was that um, we set up a practice in Northampton. So as a, my job was as, as a physiotherapist, but my passion was sports and my passion was uh, playing rugby. So my day job was being a normal a normal physiotherapist, like you know, seeing everybody out there in the uh, musculoskeletal world. But then in the two nights a week, I trained to play rugby and then play rugby for the Saints at the weekend. Fantastic, really. The, the conundrum came is when uh, the game went professional. So until that point, I actually wanted to be a physiotherapist, but then coach Northampton Saints. I was already doing the strength and conditioning whilst I was a player. So I wanted to make that so my my work life, my social life didn't really um, merge. It was you know, something that I did for fun. And of course, the game went professional. So I ended up uh, <laughs> working within the, the sport. Actually, very lucky, really. 
So um, I'll, I'll never, I mean, I don't know. I'll never forget the very first day of professionalism, 1995. So at that, that stage, Ian McGeekin, who you might well have heard of, was uh, just been drafted in as our coach. Paul Larkin, and my, another coach, myself, and I think we had um, another team manager, Lenny Newman. There were literally four of us. The owner of the club came came to us, Keith Barwell. What, what a great fellow. Kept me in work for seven years when we all thought rugby was going to go bust anyway. He basically came up with a blank piece of paper and said, right, off you go then, professional rugby. So we sat down and we literally filled in the next week of what we were going to do. I had no idea. You know, you know, we literally packed the next week full of stuff to do for the players, completely inappropriate when you look back now. We had no idea. Didn't know how much it was going to cost. We didn't know what facilities we needed. We didn't know what to do with the fellas. We just started. You know, it was all brand new. So I remember that day very well. Uh, and then, you know, four years later, I think 2000, five years later, we won the European Cup. So we obviously did something right. We did have all the best players and the best coaches. That helps, doesn't it? But we had that, that, can you imagine how steep that learning curve was from being someone that was a physiotherapist in practice, moving into a professional sport that had never had a, a history before and winning the European Cup four or five years later. An immense learning curve. But for me as an individual, you know, you don't get better continual professional development you know, in service training than that. That was just fantastic for me. No, that's incredible. I mean, I spoke with James Robson about this because I think he had the same transition from like the, the yeah, same. What, what, what do we yeah. do? <laughs> um, so, what was that like then? Like on that that day when you've got that blank sheet of paper, like whether that's figurative or not. But what, what genuinely, what were you planning to do on day one? We sat around a table. Actually, I, I'll tell you this now. When I worked for England prior to professional, and then certainly the first few years after, we were all ex teachers. James Robson, ex teacher. I don't know if that skill set just helped with your medicine, with your coaching, it just and how to deal with groups of youngsters because the, the players were still fairly young. And they're still youngsters, aren't they? Compared with me, they are. It was bizarre. It literally was a plain piece of paper. So I sat around a table with Ian McGeek and the legendary coach, you know, the other guys. And we said, well, what we do on Monday? We just penned it in. What, when do I need them in for prep? <laughs> when do I do the treatments? When can I get back to my practice? Because for the first six, seven years, I was still working in the practice for half a day and in the club for half a day. Because I kid you not, we all thought, well, professional rugby's never going to last. We'll just make the most of it while, while, we, while it's there. So every physio uh, that worked for me always worked in our practice as well. So I thought at least when the game goes bust, they've got a job to go back to. <laughs> That's how confident we were, Andy. But of course, it, that never happened. Um, it, it, the game has our game has gone from strength to strength. Mm. And so, like you, you mentioned about, were you a consultant then working there for for the the club, and then you say you had other members of staff working in your practice, mm. and then as you built a team, they'd be integrated into doing both roles. Yeah, we built a team over a period of years. We'd had no money, so to begin with, I think you've spoken to Professor Bill Ribbons, good friend of mine. So basically, I got everyone to come in and help us for free. Uh, and they did because they're just good guys. Get the good guys in there. You're always going to do well. And they were passionate. North, uh, Bill Ribbons is a Northampton man who was passionate about Northampton Saints. But Nick Birch, a back specialist, all the local doctors. Uh, um, I won't name them all, but they know who I'm talking about. They, they would come and give their time up for me, game days, training days. Um, I had a, lots of guys that came in for work experience for free. They come and do that while well, they were young physios or young massage therapists. And then I just do that, you know, put it down as part of their experiential learning. And they've all gone on to do very well. So I think rugby is a good environment for people, particularly young physiotherapists, anyone with interest in sports medicine, get in there and get your hands on players because the players are so grateful for anything you can throw at them. Uh, this is junior club rugby amateur stuff all the way through to professionals you know and he gave it gave, gave everybody that came to work with us at that time they weren't getting paid for it so he had a passion also gave him an opportunity to learn and practice the skills very quickly with people who actually were grateful for it, it wasn't an expectation then it was oh thank you very much giving your time up thank you for seeing me you know thank you for doing this for me and that actually just that that sort of positive affirmation that tap on the shoulder and pat on the back it's worth so much isn't it when you're learning 
because it is hard work. And it was, you know, I go, I, I kid you not, this sounds horrific. So I go into my practice at seven in the morning, do a couple of patients, get down to the Saints by eight for the first, you know, for the training day, leave it to go back to the practice and work there till eight at night for four or five years. Literally, I mean, my, my wife can't hear this. How on earth she got through that? with a kid, two young kids, and doing my master's degree. Now, I suspect that resonates with a lot of people that are listening to this, because I have this conversation with a lot of young physios, like yourself. Well, they're not that young, are you? But um, you go through that period, don't you, of around about five to seven years where you think you can't fit everything in. Particularly, it probably is the same in the NHS as it is in the world of private practice and sports medicine. You think, I used to get up in the morning and think, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to get through today. I'm supposed to do this. But you do. And if you can get through those, we, I mean, in rugby and in sport, they call it the hard yards. If you can get through those hard yards and, and just keep your head down and get out the other end, then actually everything then becomes really worthwhile. But it is a struggle, you know, and I, I really do feel, particularly in the last couple of years with the, with the guys, it's tough if you've got a young family trying to do the sports medicine, you're trying to do your CPD, you're trying to do your MSC. You know, the only advice I can give to people is it actually can work because there's there's a lot of through that process. Mm. And then in terms of like that, that transition between you starting off as a profession, professionals and then winning, like what, what changed, like what, what happened in that four year period? Not that, you know, that you were completely saying we've been doing things wrong, but like how have things progressed in that time period? I think what happened was um, as, as a physio, obviously I'm learning all the time, as we all are. So you've, as long as you're committed to a lifelong learning process, and I think we all are we be at doing what we're doing. So you're always learning, accumulating um, uh, experience and knowledge. And I think because I had a sporting background anyway, I played uh, and had also been a te PE teacher. I think for me, it was actually it was actually quite quite a, a good com combination of, of things that that definitely helped me get through. Um, I wouldn't have. I don't think I would have had the strength and conditioning background. I wouldn't have been uh, able to be as successful as I was or we were at that time. Because actually doing strength and conditioning as well as a physio. That's just how bizarre it is. We literally had a staff to win a European Cup in four years. We had a staff of about six people, and and now you've got more. We've literally got more strength and conditioning coaches than we had the entire staff. Now, um, I think what happened was the players. There was a, there was a change in. We were okay. We we we're good at writing plans and systems. We're, we're good at looking at the evidence, aren't we? Then putting a, a plan together and, and reassessing the plan. So we're continually reassessing the effectiveness of what we're doing. Um, but I think the play, it was the players that had a change. So they went from people that were actually work, semi, uh, either fully amateur, semi-professional, into the professional. So it took them maybe two or three years to get used to the fact that they need to do their injury mitigation stuff. They need to do their work-ons, their skills stuff. It took uh, the diet, the nutrition. It, so that, that, was a, that was a steep learning curve for them. And I think that probably took two or three years for that mental approach, that attitude for the players, and then that with the approach from the staff, then I think that sort of it came together quite nicely for us. We were lucky because I think we did have the, you know, we did have the best players. We had Pat Lambs and Tim Robbers, Matt Dawson's, you know, these guys at that time. We had Freddie Mendes. We had a lot of really good players, um, and that was the other big change I think as well. So we suddenly started to, the expectation levels of players changed. And I bet this resonates with a lot of people out there as well. So as soon as we got the Australian players in, it, they expected to have soft tissue therapy. They expected to have um, core stability training, trunk stability training or whatever. They expected to have physios there, doctors, scans. It wasn't something that our, our players were just grateful they got anything. But these guys, they were used to it in Australia and the New Zealand guys, they were used to it. And then the, um, so they drove the level of quality of provision quite quickly. Um, and now it's actually probably at the other end of the, we're at the other end of the spectrum now, um, which is good and bad. The, the players 
it's it's expected that you know we've got everything that they need whereas at the back at the beginning it was sort of a, a bonus really so i think having at, at that stage i think there's probably physiotherapy sports medicine particularly um in new zealand and south africa and australia was pretty much ahead of us i suspect in everything really yeah, I mean, that's, that's true we we were catching up but we caught up very quickly and and overtook very quickly and as you know by 2000 and three we won the world cup and we were ahead of the game and, and that will come probably come back to that i'm sure in a minute or two but and that was driven from clive woodward it said i don't want you to follow i want you to lead so we did go on this this curve i mean the more i think about it it was such an exponential curve of learning for not only the staff and and the players but you know us as medics as well mm. so the expectations levels change changed massively andy that's what happened yeah, I mean, one of my main memories was like, remember Joe Nalomu, the absolute beast in, in, in the World Cup then? And it's yeah. yeah, it's hard to believe like the the, the short time period, like you say, for actually winning the World Cup. I was in the I was in Australia for the, the Lions tour in 2001. Um, so I remember seeing several of the players out in King's Cross when I was I was out and they were definitely really? having a good time. This word, did you? <laughs> 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 There's a story we can't talk about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I probably did see you actually, but anyway, um, yeah. So, what was what, what like in terms of your involvement with those things? Then, how did it come about with the the national team? This is quite. That's this is an interesting story, really. Um, so, as amateurs, um, I obviously I love my game. I'm still playing. I thought, well, what can I do to help? Um, so, I started working with England schools. So, help provide physio cover for when we had the under-14s, under-16s, under-18s camps, all for free, just to, you know, put a little bit back into the game. Also helped my coach and everything else and kept me in the loop. Um, and then, so that, you know, we, I think I went to, um, I then got asked, because I'd done a bit of work there, I think the, uh, yeah, it was England, we had an England emerging team in 92, so we're still amateurs. Um, in this team, it was under-21s, really. They had a couple of games and it was sort of people like Lawrence Delalio and, um, the guys that went on to be star superstars later. I was still playing, so I'm, I'm actually a physio and playing against these guys. It's brilliant, but great fun. So we, we would train really hard, we play really hard, and also we party really hard because that's what you did as an amateur sports person back in those days. Probably still do now as an amateur sportsman. Actually, um, ninety four got then the physio with the England A team wasn't very well, so I got called up to do an England A team tour to uh, South Africa. So I got. Uh, stuck out there, uh, Matt Dawson's first um, sojourn with England Day as well, and that that so that was all amateur, a great fun. So I was doing my job, doing working at Saints, doing England for for fun and and to help. And but I think I'd done a, a reasonably good job because um, actually when in, <laughs> I did get interviewed for the Lions in '97, but not as a physio, as the S and C guy. Um, so I kid you not, I had an interview around a table like this, me, Ian McGeegan and Jim Telfer. So I got the two legends of rugby and me sat in there in an office in Northampton, Northampton Saints. And I'm thinking, can I swear on here? I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I doing here? And he was proper, like you've seen, you've seen Living With The Lions, it was Jim Telfer giving it me. Ian McGeegan, you know, is it a good, good cop, bad cop? Um, and I didn't get the job. How they wanted to take me as S&C and a spare physio, but I didn't get that job. And I wasn't, I actually so pleased I didn't because I actually hadn't got the skill to do a good job then at all. But I got offered the England um, job to go on the tour to Argentina. That was my first England tour, 97, as, as a professional as well, semi-professional. And I was prepared to do that, I had got the skill set to do the physio side of it. And that went really well. So I had a great tour in 97. And then um, I was a physio there for the next senior physio until a couple of years ago. Um, when it, that's, so it's been a long career since then. And on the back of then doing very well in the World Cup in 2003, got invited for the Lions and then was able, was privileged to do the next four Lions tours as well. So it's sort of not by design. It was just happened in layers, really just by getting on with the job in hand. 
Mm. And what was that experience like in Australia then in 2003? That was, the whole thing about that was uh, quite amazing. Um, we just had a reunion with the management this weekend and we sat there and just reflected on what we achieved. It's amazing, really. Um, thank you very much, Clive Woodward, because he had this vision. He wasn't the most popular bloke at the time, Clive, so he took over in 99. We went over to Australia. I think we lost 70-odd nil to Australia. Johnny Wilkins' first game, he missed a kick at goal. Just disaster. But we, So we, we're now in Brisbane, having lost this... Hum- Can you imagine being an England physio on the side of the pitch or any of the players at 70 nil down in Australia? Can you imagine how bad... I know the Ashes had a... They didn't do so well last night, did they, I don't think. But you literally... And you want to dig a hole and bury yourself. Can you imagine the stick... It's not what you want. 7-6, yeah, 70 nil. We sat down after this. The team manager then was a hard man called Roger Utley, uh, who was a legend of a rugby player. Uh, We sat there. Clive said, just remember this, we're going to win the World Cup in 2003. In four years' time, we're going to win the World Cup. I promise you we're going to win the World Cup in 2003. I'm fully committed to it. I'm selling my business. I'm going to commit to it. Who wants to go along that journey? And I looked at him and I thought, what means this? Well, it was easy for him to sell his business. It was worth about two million quid. <laughs> That's all right. He was fine, Clive. Um, but I actually thought, yeah, this man means it. And he had that blind faith through that period that we would go on and win the World Cup. No hesitation whatsoever. And I thought, right, I'm going to do it. That's it. So I, I signed up to that sort of belief. And so did Barney Kenny, my other physiotherapist, the other physiotherapist I worked with, and Richard Vendrick, the pole. I check. He, uh, he he committed to it. The docs, the other staff, we all thought, well, okay, because we knew we got good players. But it was that it was that commitment just meant for four years life was going to be hell, you know, really. But we're going to win a World Cup. We, um, what Clive did then was he built, uh, and I, I talk about this quite often when I go and talk to, to people. He built an integrated team, so I always see myself as a, a physio within a medical team, within a performance team, within a management team, within the England team. It's a bit like the guy that sweeps the leaves off the pavements at NASA. is just as important to the whole project as a guy that's sitting in the spaceship going to the moon. It's that sort of a, approach. And Clive enabled us to do that. And what, what he did, much to the annoyance of the RFU, was spend a lot of money, but by bringing in uh, to, to our integrated team, he would bring in a visions coach, um, Cheryl Calder from South Africa, a kicking coach, Dave Allred, um, a line-out throwing coach, a scrum coach, Phil Keith Roach, Simon Hardy. Um, so we'd have a, a, a big management team, but we all were, we didn't necessarily get on with each other, but we all had respect for each other and we, we formed a really good team. So, and, and again, this will resonate with physios, medics, is that we were client-based. The whole thing was client-based, the client being the player. So if we, we were working with a player, we would draw in from all these. If I got an injured player, I'd still be doing his line-out throws and his S&C and still doing his vision coach training as part of that rehab process. So that was actually, at that stage, I think that was quite an advanced way of working. And of course... It worked, didn't it? Uh, the boys bought into it. We did have the best players. And we, that journey was just amazing. Um, so we got to World Cup final. We won the World Cup. It wasn't by, it was by design. It wasn't a fluke. We, we, that was what, had we not won, it would have failed. We know probably in our own eyes anyway. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> bizarrely, we then went on to the next World Cup final as well with a team that wasn't as well prepared. <laughs> Um, but the RFU, for the, their wisdom, didn't really follow the model that we created. And I think that was so disappointing for Clive that he obviously left and, and uh, things have been a little bit up and down since then. And now we've got Eddie Jones trying to drive that same process uh, to mm-hmm. another World Cup. Does that all make sense? I've, I've, no, no, it does. Like, yeah, but... No, no, it does. No, it's really interesting because I was actually chatting with Doug Jones. I, um, I went for breakfast with Doug on right. Friday. And he was talking about that. He was talking about a physio who works in the you know the football Premier League, and just said he's been brilliant because he's embraced bringing in and knowing that the players will go and see other people and and so on, and just embracing that rather than being threatened by it. 
So that really does resonate that that's obviously what you guys were doing, which maybe they weren't things that you would have done before even, but... I'm completely indebted to people like Doug. So Doug was at Sale uh, as a young physio. So one of my roles and Barney Kenny's roles, we go on the road and visit all the clubs to visit our players. Can you imagine what that's like as a as an England medic going to someone else's business and then trying to <laughs> tell them what to do? which we didn't do, but going into someone else's workplace and observing them, right? it can be a nightmare. But our physios, like Doug at, um, at Sale and all the physios in the other teams around the country, although they all knew I was a Northampton Saints and they all knew I was England and there was a lot of conflict at the times, were brilliant. We all had the same, we all had the same um, concern though, and it was the, the player. And they knew I cared about the players and Barney cared about the players. So... We used to duck into these clubs undercover. Used to get, you know, Richard Cockle used to well, lambast me every time I went to Leicester. Can you imagine? He's the Leicester Tigers through and through. And I'm a Saints man going into his club. We hate each other, Saints and Tigers, you know, in a good way. Um, but the medics were brilliant. You know, they would, um, because we're trying to do the best for the player. But I think uh, that those hard yards of going into clubs, talking to uh, physiotherapists like Doug Jones, I talked to Doug about at the time who was up there, I can't remember who was up at sale then, but you got Charlie Hodgson, uh, uh, Mark Quato, Andy Sheridan, lots of lots of players up there, uh, to, just to get that shared information that, so that when they came to work with us with England for those short blocks of period of time, we could seamlessly move in and out. Mm. Yeah, and then, so how was that then? So you were managing both the, the England role alongside doing the, the role at Northampton? Well, what I had to do was I had to go up Northampton um, Saints. I just when I fully committed to England to win the World Cup. So I mean, um, it's heartbreaking. I think 2002, I had to go to the boss Keith Barwell and say, "Look, you know, I think we're going to win the World Cup. I can't carry on doing three or four jobs. <laughs> I'm going to die doing this." And he said, "Good luck." Patted me on the back. They all did, and said, "Off you go." Um, and I, trans- I, tra- I transitioned from being um, working for Saints to being a non-executive director for the next 10 years. So I'm still, in- I'm st- and I'm still involved with Northampton Saints now. I will be. It's a lifelong thing for me. It's my team. Crikey, I did 500 games there with them as a physio and a player. So, um, and my kids have grown up with Northampton. My wife was already a Northampton Saints fan when we got married. So I'm not no getting away from that. Um, but I couldn't, physically couldn't do... Um, all of it in one go. But I was in a position where I could do it at that stage because I'd done my, you know, I got that volume of work behind me. Yeah. And so, I mean, that must have been a very compelling conversation with Clive Woodward then. What was it about him when he came in that made you actually believe what he said? Um, You could just see the conviction in his eyes and his tone, you know. He committed to it. And he, 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 you either go on the journey and you do, or you, you just say... No, you know, and a lot of my coaches, the top coaches I work with, have been a little bit like that. You either come on this journey with me and commit to it, or no hard feelings, there's the door. Um, Eddie's done that. Uh, the best coach I work with, probably ever, uh, Wayne Smith, uh, All Blacks coach, uh, came to work with Northampton. I've been so lucky with the people I've worked with. He more or less did the same thing when he joined Northampton, said, No, this is where we're going, this is what I want to do. You're either with me or you're not, and uh, no hard feelings, you know. And uh, and that was it. So once you committed to that, you you basically you you, you get on with it, don't you? Mm. And then what was the experience like? You mentioned that the um, that the next World Cup because that was that was quite an interesting one, wasn't it? Yeah, so, we yeah, we should have won it. Actually, it was Mark Quato who scored a try that the linesman disallowed, if you remember. And I was about ten feet behind him, and he definitely scored it. Mm. <laughs> We'd lost to South Africa thirty nil in the first game. So it wasn't looking so great. And uh, we, uh, the players had a meeting. The players then had a meeting. They had a lot of meetings in the medical room, which is great. So we're part of that. Then they spoke to the coaches. We reset the goals. And believe it or not, they turned it around. We, you know, we beat Australia, beat France, and ended up uh, playing you know, uh, South Africa again in, in the final of, um, of that World Cup. In fact, the, I think my favourite game ever, probably, apart from winning the World Cup, was... Um, playing Australia in Marseille in the football stadium there, semi-final of the World Cup, not expected to win, not expected to be there. And we beat them and the atmosphere and just everything about it. The night before, France had beaten the All Blacks 
in Marseille as well. So the whole thing was, it was one of the best rugby atmospheres you're ever, ever going to get. And we were so close in the final. But that was actually pretty much player-driven, whereas the, um, the World Cup before was pretty much coach-driven. But credit to the coaches, because it was Brian Ashton who was head coach then. Uh, they listened, took it on board, and then just moved on rather than sort of taking it personally as an affront. Um, and it worked. We, we just all jumped in again, again together. Yeah. Mm. And like when you're working with these different coaches, like you say, you've meant work with some amazing ones. Like, do, do you take a lot from them in, in terms of how the way you speak with players or manage? If you looked at a picture frame of the guys I've worked with, uh, Jack Rowell, who, nice man, but could be horrible. He was our first coach. Then we've got Clive, who was obviously very eclectic. Ian McGeekin, Wayne Smith, who is one of the world's best coaches. Martin Johnson, six foot seven, powerhouse of a man. And Eddie Jones is a little rock violet. They're just a few of the coaches I've worked with. They're all at the top of their game. And I've worked with them all. They're all con- completely different, except they're all angry men. <laughs> but they're all driven. And you're right, you know. And I, the, the key is, um, and it's probably the same in any walk of life, isn't it? You have to be adaptable and flexible. If you can be adaptable and flexible, um, then you can can get on and, and I suppose when I look back, I, I must have been quite an adaptable person because I have adjusted to every time someone else has come in and it's a different way of doing things. We've been able to adapt it and do it and not get the sack because you don't last very long, do you, in professional sport if you're not doing a good job? I keep telling myself that. You know, I've been in it 30 odd years. I'm thinking, well, I must have done a reasonable job, otherwise I would have been sacked multiple times by now. Um yeah, so adaptability, I think, is is the key. But also trust in your skill set. You know, after all, we're, we're medical professionals, you know, with experience, um, and we care. Um, I got told by Phil Batty, who was Manchester City's doctor and worked with England for a short period of time. He's a good guy to talk to, Andy, as well. Uh, he works down in London now, lives up, is up north, he's up. Yeah, that other side of the pen always for me. He actually, he lived, he used to live in the same block, or I used to see him in Manchester a lot, actually. He's yeah. on my list, so he's, he's, he's yeah. coming up next year. Phil, Phil, brilliant bloke. Um, but he did, one of the things he said to me was, Phil, just remember, players don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And he'd obviously got that from somewhere else. But actually, that is a tr- that is a true as you can get. And, and I think in the early days, we, we weren't that skilled. When I was a young physio, I wasn't that skilled, but we used to throw everything at it. So it'd be, you know, we're always available at 12 hours a day or whatever it has to be. And I think the players appreciated that uh, because it showed you you got that care about what you were doing. It's a bit of a passion, isn't it? And that's whether you're working in um, paediatrics or in neurophysio or whatever walk, walk of our profession you're working in, just, not just sports medicine. It goes across the whole board, doesn't it? Mm, no, definitely. And like, how do you do it? Especially coming from you, there's like, how do you tread that line between being very close with the players, which I'm sure you are, to keeping that boundary? No, totally professional. And you know, um, we have banter as you all, always do, but um, the line's fairly, fairly well, well drawn. It has been probably since we got to the prof- probably nine, probably from the professional era. Still go out and have a drink and do stupid things up until about 97. But then, it, it, as, as the players have become professional, that that distance ha- has grown. We still have a great time. Don't get me wrong. We're still going to have a few beers and a sing-song and all the rest, the stuff that you would expect. But we're not the best pals. We are we are friends. But, you know, it's... And I've got some really good friends f- from the players. But um, we, I think we pride ourselves and we keep that professional relationship all the way through. Yeah. You mm-hmm. can't go over that line, really. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned you were on several Lions tours. Are there any particularly memorable things that came out of those? <laughs> yeah, they've been brilliant. They, they are. The best. You've been on Lions tour, haven't you, too, as a spectator? I can't wait to go as a spectator. They are just brilliant. I mean, it is the best thing you can do in my profession as a physiotherapist in sports medicine in rugby. You didn't get any better, really, apart from playing one. I'd like to have played one. Because um, everybody wants to be there. Everybody wants you to be there. The clubs want you to be there. 
you've got 30,000 Brits following you around. You walk out of the hotel and there's a sea of red everywhere. It, and the games are awesome. All the players are the best of their profession. I mean, you'd pay to go and watch a training session. You know, I'm standing on the side of the pitch during training. And we look at each other. The Bob Stewart, you know, the, uh, the Scotland physio is now England physio. Most of po- poach him. James Robson, Prav Mathema, Welsh physio. We would just stand there looking at each other. Aina Falvey, the uh, Irish doctor. Uh, Gary O'Driscoll, when he was there with us, um, who's now Arsenal's uh, head of medicine. Uh, I, I, don't, I'm Richard, well, I don't miss anybody out, but the, all, all the, we'd just stand and look at each other and think, what is it's so good. You'd pay to be there. Never mind, you know, getting paid to be there. Yeah, and I've seen some amazing... Watching uh, people like Brian O'Driscoll training, We've actually stopped and applauded during training sessions. The stuff is that good. And then that translates onto the games. And some of our games have been brilliant. You know, the South African tour, I think we we lost one. We, we should have won one. We did win one. Uh, we could have won one, but we didn't win that series. But the winning series in Australia, you know, how did you beat that winning series with the Lions? That was, God, what year was that? I've forgotten. <laughs> it was 2005, 2009, 2011 winning series in Australia. But then my last test match um, with the Lions was the draw in Auckland against New Zealand. Uh, and that was, what a stunning... T- New Zealand is, is just an amazing place to go anyway. I mean, uh, unless you've been there, you don't realise just what rug- rugby as a game meant, meant to these guys. Everybody knows the game. You know, you'd be going from the team hotel. You step out of the team hotel to drive to the game and all the shopkeepers, the hotel owners, everyone, they line the streets and clap the bus through. This is the opposition. I mean, it's just remarkable. Obviously, not when you're on the field, but the whole nation gets behind their team. It must bring in millions of uh, dollars or pounds or whatever. Um, and they generally want you to be there. The game's of a high standard. And, um, yeah, just it, and to beat the All Blacks down there, I think that game in Wellington when we beat them... Um, you may not remember this. They had um, a player sent off. Uh, Sonny Boy Williams made a bad tackle. Andy, Anthony Watson um, was sent off for it. And we managed to win that game, tie the series, and of course, drew the last game. But at that stage, I was in the coach's box during that game, not on the pitch side. Because what we do is we put one of us up in the box with a, a time delay video. So we can watch everything that goes on, but 10 seconds later, then feed it into the coaches or feed it back down to the dock or the physio's pitch side, just that extra layer of safety. And also just give a, a heads up to the coaches what might they may need to do. So I'm actually in the box with the coaches when we win that game. And they, had, they had to walk down the stand and to the changing rooms. It's um, crikey. It was one, probably one of the most enjoyable 50 seconds of my life, really. <laughs> Yeah, and are they are the All Blacks then going there? They're they're revered as being the, the a different breed of in in the world of rugby union. So, do you sense anything different from being around the the, the squad and the team to anyone anyone else? New Zealand, the culture is um, they have a history um, of being the best for such a long time, um, so their expectation level is already there. So it's very easy for them to fail if they lose two games in a row. It's a national disaster. Um, they've just have a slightly, well, slightly different between them and probably other uh, nations around the world is the All Blacks know their history really well. Uh, they know the value of the Silver Fern and they could probably all name the test team from 1958 that beat the Springboks. Their depth of knowledge and love of the game is immeasurable. Uh, and I think we're catching up with that now. Uh, still, and um, coaches like Stuart Lancaster with, with England and Eddie and, and others have tried to instill that, you know, that knowledge and um, of, of the history of what it means to represent that shirt and give it to the next group of players in a better condition than it is now, in a better state than it is now. So we're, we're catching up there. Um, so they are, you know, the All Blacks are fully committed. They just tend to generate such good players. I think it probably, a bit like the, the Australians and New Zealanders tend to be really good athletes. You know, if you think the Australians are, what, top three rugby union um, team in the world, but their main sport is Aussie rules, and the, the next layer of players probably play rugby league, 
So the players that are playing Aussie rugby union are probably the third layer of really good oval ball players. And they're still, you know, but the whole nation, uh, their attitude to wellness, fitness, strength and health and fitness, whatever you want to call it, strength and conditioning, sports, it's in their culture, isn't it? All the kids go out and play. So it goes a bit deeper than just, you know, rugby and stuff. It um, goes to schools. And in, in New Zealand, it's pretty much the same. They're, you know, they put a high emphasis on physical education at school, health and well-being, health-related fitness, all that stuff that we really we need to catch up on in this country. Uh, I'm on my soapbox now. You know, we haven't got dedicated PE teachers in primary schools, which is a farce as far as I'm concerned. The kids, you know, when the kids develop their interest in anything and their motor skills and passions is when they're young, you know, to age of 11. So we should be exposing these kids to something that's going to help them through the rest of their lives. I am getting my soapbox now, aren't I? So we're, we're lagging a little bit behind in just our, as a nation, as a culture we have, and that drive to um, that's going to ultimately produce really, really good sports people. Mm. You mentioned Sonny Bill Williams, and like he's been at the top in so many different sports. Of like, what do you make of him as a character? Well, I actually know him um, very well, and um, although he got sent off in that Lions game, I swapped my kit with him at the end, so I've got all his kit here, SBJ and all my kit. You know, as is. Uh, he was devastated. It, it didn't mean it rushed blood to the head, so he got a bit of a bad reputation. This guy's unreal. He, he can box, he can play rugby, netball at that international level. He was a rugby league, rugby union, basically do anything he wanted. And, he, and and all his family, by the way, as well. And he just said, no, I love sport at school. I had the opportunity to do stuff. A bit like the Nick Faldo. I think it's, it's an interesting story. Um, his parents literally spent the whole of his teenage years, trying different sports with him, you know, te- and they literally ran their lives to f- give him stuff to do. And ultimately he found golf and then it obviously it all paid off, but he was an all round complete sports person as well. Michael Schumacher uh, uh, was very fortunate to treat Bill Ribbons and I treated him actually. He broke his leg at, in practice at Silverstone. Um, tremendous athlete, ball player, hand-eye coordination, a badminton tennis player, fit as a fiddle it wasn't just a racing driver you know just this all-round ability and suddenly bill williams got to be one of the top sports people that that, that i've met that over a, over a series of sports yeah interesting mm-hmm. when i speak to him I'm, I'm name dropping massively here but i also had the opportunity to meet michael johnson um probably one of the few people i've had my photo taken with i thought i'm never going to meet anyone like this guy again and he was completely uh, to talk to just sounded the same as the Sunny Bill. You know, you can just hear in the voice, the passion and dedication to what they want to do and their love of what they're doing. The only thing is the difference was Sunny Bill Williams could do multiple sports, whereas uh, Michael said, no, I can run fast. I can't catch fast kick. So what you lot do, not interesting at all, uh, which was quite, quite interesting. So he'd gone through a system that just produced, he was fast, he was picked out as being fast and that's what he did, yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? Like you think of Michael Johnson and he that two two races, he was just absolutely spectacular, right? He got Bolt, who's you know, very short distances. But then like yeah, Sonny Will Williams is getting in a boxing ring against Completely it was Bolt there, wasn't he, that he beat? Yeah. yeah, I mean it was not a heavyweight champion, amateur of, of New Zealand and an all black. Not bad, is it, really? Yeah. It's no, it is it is really unbelievable. I, we have the similar sort of talented people out there, we just don't nurture them through it. But even like with um, Anthony Joshua, Anthony Joshua was like a, he's a late developer, wasn't he, to boxing? And you see, you see what he looks a natural athlete is a natural athlete, and has done what he's done. Yeah, yeah. Opportunity, isn't it? Really, exposure and opportunity to do stuff. But you need to get you need to get these um, these people involved from from the age of you know standing up until you leave school, not uh, not later on. No, no, I agree. Well, both my parents uh, were teachers, so and they they definitely were were into promoting promoting that side. Um, but yeah, no, that was that was a deviation, but very interesting. Yeah, sorry, it's, 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 no, 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 it's good. Yeah. It's good. It's interesting. So, just in terms of you, then, like, are, are there any particular memorable things in your career that you've not mentioned that you think would be of interest? 
yeah, get, getting married and having the kids, <laughs> those are the first every time, otherwise you're, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> um, I think one thing that helped me uh, massively uh, was, believe it or not, um, I've, sort of been, I, I've actually competed at international level at three different sports. Not very well, but uh, as a student, I was a judo player. So I actually uh, played judo and I trained with Neil Adams and uh, Brian Jackson, Dave Starbrook at the National Sports Centre at Crystal Palace as a university student. They gave me my training ethic. I wasn't very good and I, and I, stopped, I stopped that as I, was, I got to a level and then I started to get pummeled by everybody. I thought I'm just not quick enough or skilled enough, but I got to a good level. So British universities. Then I broke my kneecap playing soccer and had to have a, a, a prolonged time out. So I thought, I'll have a go at the, the we saw this triathlon advertised, um, one of the very first, just bit back in, uh, I told you, a long time ago, in the early 80s. So me and my mates, uh, we trained up for this, we enjoyed it so much, we did 30 of them, and I ended up going to Hawaii and did the Ironman in, in Hawaii for uh, as part of the Great Britain squad. I can't believe I did this as a rugby player. And I finished it. That's all I wanted to do. I wasn't ever going to win it. Um, but I became quite, um, I don't think they could believe what they got when I got out to Hawaii to do this thing. So that was in 85. But that helped me. So I had a block period of two years where I wrote a training program for endurance rather than power, rugby in the sports. I actually wrote myself a program and, and got through it and completed it. So I thought, oh, interesting. That was a great process. Straight away, I went back to rugby union, which was woefully short of skill and strength and, and what I needed to play rugby union but um, I was probably the fittest player playing in the elite rugby at that time obviously the game was only for 80 minutes long I've been training seven hours a day piece of cake um, but by the Christmas I redesigned my training program uh, got my first game for Northampton Saints and played for them for 10 years so a good adaptability but it taught me that you can if you if you design the right programs and adhere to them you can make the change you want. So I went from different energy systems, for example, from a, from a power athlete to an endurance athlete back to a mixed games playing type athlete, multiple sprints, which was uh, really kind of cool. And, and so I've always had that passion about being fit. And even now the boys would, would be reluctant to go on a training session with me because I only train at their weaknesses, as you know, Andy. Never train at their strengths. I just bring them along and do things I can do. Um, and I think that helped massively because I've got this empathy with what's needed to, to train, uh, prepare yourself and recover yourself from that level of, of, um, of sport that you're doing. I think the boys appreciate that, or my, not but the players appreciate that. Uh, so they, they, I have a good buy-in from the people I work with. I think that helps. So if you can demonstrate that empathy to your patient, as you do in a, in a clinical, you know, then understanding that you, you know and you're there to help. Um, in terms of getting compliance from your patient, whether it's in a treatment room, in clinic, or whether it's in a gym in, uh, with a sports team, is massive, isn't it? No, definitely. Yeah. No, it's, it's an interesting philosophy. And I think, as you say, about doing those multi sports. Uh, not that many people do it now, do they? Like even like kids at a young age are playing football at four or five. This is where um, this is where doing a being being a teacher for a few years helped. I actually did a coaching award every year. I taught in a different sport. I've got my FA badge. I've got uh, net. I can referee or umpire. Sorry, netball games. Did a volleyball, so tennis. So um, believe it or not, so I've got all these coaching awards tucked away under my belt. And I'd advise any of our guys listening to this. Go and do something that's outside the box that, that might help. So if I get a netball that comes into the practice, I can actually design stuff that they can do and show a little bit of knowledge about. And, and they then suddenly they become engaged because, oh, he knows a little bit about my sport or whatever. It's helped massively, you know. Um, go out and, so when I'm interviewing people, I'm sure you're the same. I like to, we assume that you're good at your skills as a physiotherapist, sports medicine, but we're interested in what else you're going to bring to the team, particularly with England and stuff. You know, what else are you have you got there that's shown that you're you're a bit different? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, I definitely, that would be a strong bit of advice to anyone that's listening to this that wants to move up that um, sports medicine. Program. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, I know Dave Fever always says that he wants people in that have worked in the NHS have had experience in that area. I was at a, a conference at UCLan with Mark Leather, and he was. 
Um, it wasn't Mark actually doing the talk, but they were just talking about getting kids playing sport early, getting them moving, just naturally doing that rather than just being pigeonholed into one sport. Yeah, I mean, if you get a chance, I would really suggest, if you don't already, but, you know, go and listen to people like uh, Vern Gambetter and, and Calvin Giles. They're old guys, they're older than me. That's how old you are, you two. Um, but the philosophy is the same as mine always has been. I think I've taken a lot on board from what they We were around in the 70s and 80s when we, we were talking about, if we're not careful, we're going to have a health uh, disaster in 20, 30 years, and we're still talking about it now, aren't we? But they're good guys, and uh, a lot of common sense there as well. Mm, definitely. And then, so yeah, to wrap up here then, like, what are you working on at the moment, then what are your objectives? Um. COVID's put a slight spanner in the works for us all. So I've gone back into my clinic um, more often now. Um, I uh, am now self-employed. I'm, I'm still on the consultancy role with England Rugby, but not doing an awful lot because you can't go in and out anyway. And they're, they're pretty well catered for now. So that side of it is, um, is minimal. Uh, Northampton Saints, I'm there uh, to help. Uh, not, I don't do any hands-on. I leave the medics alone. Matt Lee and his team there are fantastic. They don't need me hovering over their shoulders. So I'd try and help in other ways, if you like, um, with the Saints. So that's my rub- love of rugby catered for. Physio at the clinic. And I'm at an age, really, anywhere I'm trying to um, buy a little bit of time back for me and the family. Uh, I'm also doing some visiting lecturing for University of Bedfordshire, UCL, and um, just taking on Birmingham University as well, just to try and have chats like this, really, where um, I can sort of help help young and up and coming or aspiring uh, sports physios or sports medics, medics to have an idea of what what it might take, uh, and not to get too disillusioned when it gets really hard, uh, but sort of the directions in which they might want to think. And I think because we've all got this knowledge, I can actually link the bits of knowledge together, like James James Robson can and Bob Stewart and the, the, the older guys in our game, because we've had experience at getting it wrong and, and knowing the bits you can do right. So uh, it's just joining the bits of knowledge that you've got uh, to, to to make it appropriate for what you actually want to end up doing. And, and I think that it's just the same in NHS, private practice or, or the sports medicine field. It's all... It's the same process. Doesn't matter which area you're working in. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, it's really interesting. It's good to see you going back to the places that you you learned from and uh, putting yeah, it back into there. Quite, these chats are quite enjoyed. I do laugh at myself though when I think about it. Um, how how where's it gone the time? I've literally got to a stage where I've done so much CPD. I think every time I learn something new, some of the old stuff gets pushed out the back. And every now and again, I'll come across something. Although I used to do this technique, when did I stop doing that? I'm going to do it again. Bizarre. Um, because I, sometimes I don't think I got probably the best advice at times. I tried to do it by volume rather than make being specific. But that helps in, in rugby because we, are, we see such a massive spread of different injuries, you know, and even we can become myopic at times. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. And last question. Sorry, go on. I think that's why I've enjoyed working. I've always worked in practice one day a week, even when I was full time with England. Uh, and the argument with the RFU was that I needed to, one, keep my hands hard out of camps, but also I just needed to have a broader view of the profession, not just the sports medicine. And I think that's really important. That's why I like the guys that work in with sports teams to still do a general clinic where they've got to work with older people, people who hurt the back sitting desks all day long or the neural side, neuro side of things. It does you good to keep that breadth of knowledge and not just focusing on just a yeah. bit. No, that's exactly what Doug was saying, actually. He said he loves doing both, but he actually, for his own stimulation as well, it's like it's good to... Yeah. To, to, to do both of them um yeah. yeah and then final question you've mentioned a lot of people there but are there any people that you think have had a really significant impact on where you are today um yeah i think i probably mentioned most in terms of rugby i've got a few um that have helped my rugby career um the guy that persuaded me to Paul Whitty, uh, god rest his soul was my first partner business partner is my physio he's a physio uh, at um, saints 
for encouraging me to make the switch and guarantee I got somewhere to go and work if I did. Um, Keith Barwell, who funded Northampton Saints through that professional era, at his own cost, his family's, he wasn't the well, he's, he's a wealthy gentleman, Keith, but he's not a billionaire. And he was completely committed to the Saints in the same way as Clive was fully committed to that, that England development. And a lot of people have shown a lot of faith in me along, along those ways, uh, in, including uh, James Robson, who uh, he picked his medical team and gave me that opportunity to work with the guys I've worked with there four times in a row. Uh, Bill Ribbons uh, and our local orthopaedic guys who we work very closely with. We've got such a good relationship with them um, that then our network is fantastic. I don't know everything. I know I don't. And I'm quite happy to pick up a phone and talk to you or Bill or whoever to ask for advice. And we've always worked like that. And that's been a, a massive influence as well. But, you you know, um, I think um, the family, it's tough. You've got to keep reminding yourself it should be family first. Very difficult when you're working in our our line of work so just every now and again i think think back and think the the sac it's not a sacrifice it's a choice you made the choice to do it but it still can can be hard and so i think you should uh, be thankful for that every now and again i definitely am there as well but there's i mean there, there are so many i've met so many good people on the way through there was a lot a lot of good people out there and if you're pre prepared to go and talk to people you'll 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 be amazed yeah brilliant no no i've really enjoyed that so yeah, thank you yeah. that was some very good chats yeah um, so brilliant no appreciate your time yeah, phil and uh, survive anyway for an hour yeah exactly you've made it for an hour which is longer than what we said we were going to do but uh well done your voice has lasted as well so well done yeah wait is that all right brilliant mate yeah no really appreciate that and um yeah, yeah well, uh, well specifics in there but that's a general picture really no, exactly. Well, as you said beforehand, we'll uh, we'll save the unedited version for when we catch up for a drink uh, or something. I mean, the thing is, I could spend an hour talking about any one of the campaigns, and I did 27 tours in a row. You know, you, you said 27 tours in a row. I missed my wife's birthday for 27 years in a row because it's on June June the 5th. I missed my daughter. I mean, don't put this. I missed my daughter's graduation, two graduations, my best mate's funeral. I look back at it, and it sometimes I think that's horrific. But at the time, you know, it was oh, it, it seemed the right thing to do. But mm. on reflection, you think, you know, this, this. I'm not trying to put a down on this at all. My dad died. I was in camp, heart attack, 72 years old. Get a phone call. Uh, I mean, we're down in camp, about to fly to Australia. So I said, John O was in charge at the time. I said, my dad's just, I need to go back. So he said, I'm fine, no problem. So off, off went home. Um, I came back down, there was nothing I could do. So I flew to Australia with the team, trained for the week, flew back, did my dad's eulogy. I had a few papers, which is awesome. Didn't even, I got off the plane, stayed in Australian time, did the eulogy, got back on the plane, flew back to Australia, and we beat Australia in Perth the day after. And I looked back and think, that's just bizarre that you'd do that. But I'm, I convinced myself my, that's what my dad wanted, would have done. That's what yeah, said. yeah. It, we live in a bizarre world, you know, and those sort of, uh, we used to call them sacrifices. They're not the choices. You don't have to do it. You, you choose to do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, but you think, how do you get through all that? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm sure no, you, no, definitely. You've got similar stories. I'm sure you have. Have you done that hard yards bit? Where you've tried to do in the family, the MSC. Yeah, well, I mean, I've not got a fam I've got a girlfriend, so I've I've not sort of had to go down that route. My I've, so I'm sports science is is my background. So, well, then I set this company up in um, ten years ago, and it's just yeah, it's it's just it is a slog. But I I've not got the family to, so I can be very selfish with what I do. Which many yeah. people tell me I am all the time anyway. So, um, how old are you now? I'm forty two. Yeah. Okay. Well, you might have escaped it then. 
Yeah, yeah maybe. maybe. Well, my girlfriend's 22, so I don't know yet. Well, I'd have that. You might, you might be getting it as a lot. Yeah, it could be even tougher for you, mate. <laughs> I know, exactly, yeah. So, uh, no, we'll see. Yours. We'll see how it goes. But, well, I'll, well I'll, I'll come down and um, catch up with you because we've already arranged with Bill that he wants us to come and present at the Northampton. Is it Sports Medicine? Oh, what, you're going to come and present at our group, are you? Oh, that'd be yeah, yeah, so he's asked us to do that. So we do a lot of work with diagnostic ultrasound. We're doing a lot with focus shockwave. So I don't know if you know James Brown, but he, he's a... So, yeah, so James doing some work with him. Chris Myers at the Smug, the ultrasound group. So we're, we're working with a lot of different, like the England team, football. Yeah. Um, I was meant to meet yeah, Crab, actually. Pardon? I know everybody. But you, the in nature your world, yeah, you do. Because of what I've done for the last how many years, I literally know everybody because they've all been to see us or tried to sell us something or we've worked with them. It's brilliant. But that's why the network is so good. And that's why we get yeah. good results because we're quite happy to pick up a phone and, and get the guy that knows. You know, yeah. if I want to know about something specific, it will ring the guy that is the best guy. You know, it's brilliant, isn't it? What a no, I, th I think that's it. I think as long as everyone's open-minded, that's all we want to do is like, look, if people are interested in what we're talking about, we're more than happy to support and ed well, we'll educate to the max. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, nice to talk to you. Uh, yeah, Likewise. No, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep in touch on it. So do you want me to cut out the bit from um, that you mentioned there, so in terms of like the, the sacrifices bit? I think so, because it's a bit of a downer because they don't want to put people off. Would be yeah, yeah. More inspirational than you can sure. be a bit, there's a lot of realism in there but i think that the, that's a bit too much of that yeah yeah no problem i'll cut that off and um so what i tend to do is i'll sort of put it on um social media do you want me yeah. to run any videos past you first before you, i put them out i'm quite happy i don't think i said anything stupid there so we're, we're no 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 it was all good and are you on twitter and instagram or anything like that no just linkedin yeah uh, I'm in LinkedIn. My daughters are on um, the other, and my wife are on the other stuff. Yeah. I won't yeah. tag them in it. No, I'll leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> good, man. Appreciate well, that, Phil. Really good, mate. Cheers, Andy. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.